think more carefully in a philosophical way about how science and religion interact. My own personal views, uh, philosophical views, would be it is impossible to, t to tease them apart completely. perception of a conflict between science and religion uh, begin? Yes. When so, and where? Yes, so usually it's traced back to uh, Draper's book, The Conflict Between Science and Religion, uh, published in 1874 in the United States. Draper was an American chemist. Uh, and there's a, a, a follow-up book that's very often linked to Draper's um, White's book on the, uh, the war between science and theology, uh, which is published in the 1890s. So, it's the second half of the 19th century again, which I think is a key period. Um, that's when you get the, the beginnings of an attempt to look at the history of the relationship between science and religion as being one of conflict or war. You get people before that talking about how science and religion um, as bodies of knowledge could be in conflict, but you don't get this attempt to use that notion as a um, historiographical um, way, a historiographical framework to study the past. So it's in the context of the debates over Darwin um, in, in the second half of the 19th century. It's in the context of the process of professionalizing science. Um, and it's a very, and it's in, it's in the United States. It's, it's that, that, I think that's significant too, although it's taken up by some British intellectuals and scientists. So um, it's it's a Western notion, and that's I think that's significant. Um, uh, Ron um, uh, organized, or along with uh, John Brook, a book called "Science and Religion Around the World," um, and we very quickly realized when we heard the uh, talks by people who were looking at non-Western science and religion that the conflict thesis had no traction there at all. Yes. And um, this, this perception of uh, conflict uh, was amplified in the Victorian era. Yes, it's, uh, it's the second part of the Victorian era, the middle of the Victorian period, so the middle of the 19th century. Uh, it is, so some people have argued that it is a, um, a byproduct of the professionalization of science. So when you try to professionalize science, that means you drive out all of the uh, natural theologians and all the Anglican clergymen who are dabbling in science or doing natural history. Um, others have said, well, it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a conflict that exists at the level of ideas. You've got two incommensurate uh, ways of looking at the world. Um, I think probably we have to take a lot of factors into account. I don't think it's just an intellectual conflict. Uh, and, I, and I think I agree that professionalization is part of it. Um, but I don't think that um, if you look at the public perception of science religion, for example, which I've been working on now uh, quite a lot, um, I don't think you will find that they accept the notion of conflict. And neither do people like Huxley and Tyndall, who have a very complex attitude towards the notion of the conflict thesis. They acknowledge there's a conflict between science and theology, because theology is they see theology as dealing with the world of fact and therefore it's part of science. But for them, if you define religion uh, not as a body of, of, uh, of um, doctrine that you have to believe in uh, or a body of knowledge that you have to accept, if you define religion as being in the realm of the of feelings and emotions, uh, the realm of art and poetry, um, both Huxley and Tyndall um, wrote uh, explicitly, there's no conflict between science and religion. So they bought on that, uh, when they looked at science and religion, they bought into the non-overlapping magisteria notion yes. that, is, that Gould later put forward. Um, the conflict does take place between science and theology, or potentially could, because I think if you look carefully at Tyndall and Huxley and even Herbert Spencer, there is actually a th kind of a theology that, that is based on science in their minds that they're still adhering to. So they, they still have this notion, even though they're agnostics, um, there's this mysterious presence in nature, which if you try to 
put into dogmatic shape, uh, if you try to make it fact. Um, that's what they're rejecting. They're saying you can't, you can never get at this unknowable, capital U, as Spencer called it, uh, in, in nature. But it still exists. And we try to talk about it when we write our poetry and we, we, we paint our pictures about nature because it's, it's, there's, it's, it's a very romantic view of nature in a way that they're embracing. Considering this, this idea that uh, science and religion are non-overlapping magisteria and act in, in different spheres, uh, do you think it's possible to make uh, intersections between them, uh, like to study religion scientifically or religious phenomena scientifically? So now you're asking, asking a historian, a philosophical yeah. question. <laughs> Um, which I try to avoid as best I can when I'm teaching because I try to train my students to think like historians and to think about, um, you know, what do the historical actors think about science religion? So what is Huxley, what do Huxley and Tyndall think about science or religion? Um, but I have studied um, some philosophy. I mean, I, my, I originally was more an intellectual historian than a historian of science. And um, I don't think, uh, I think the non-overlapping magisteria notion, I think philosophically, I think it's, it's, it can't be done. Because you're starting from a certain set of assumptions about the world, and that's going to affect the way that you look at nature and at religious ideas. And so um, if you want to think more carefully in, in a philosophical way about how science and religion interact, my own personal views, uh, philosophical views, would be it is impossible to, t to tease them apart completely. Se você quiser saber mais sobre esse assunto, a gente deixou aqui na descrição do vídeo links e informações sobre o tema. Música